Oh, dead. Okay, welcome to our uh, Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, the sixth lecture in our Origin and Evolution of the Moon uh, course. My name is Jim Head at Planetary Geosciences at Brown University, and together with David Kring at the Lunar Planetary Institute, uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's lecture. Um, I'm currently in Moscow, Russia, at the uh, ninth uh, Moscow Solar System Symposium held at the Institute for Space Research. Um, the premier space research institute in Russia, and uh, we're having a really excellent meeting, a five-day meeting on all the planetary bodies, and uh, and it's uh, really excellent. So we're really fortunate to have with us today in our continuing discussions, um, Bill Botke um, will talk to us about the lunar and Martian bombardment, testing planet formation models, and this will follow up on our earlier lectures on transformative lunar science, the history of lunar exploration, formation of the moon, uh, formation of the lunar crust in the aftermath, and again, the structure of the lunar crust, mantle, and core uh, delivered by Maria Zuber last, year, last week. So um, today, today's speaker, Bill Botke, uh, is at the Southwest West Research Institute in Boulder. He's the director of the another survey institute, the Center for Lunar Origin and Evolution, CLOE, and indeed the director of the Department for Space Studies at the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. Bill got his uh, education in BS in physics and astrophysics at the University of Minnesota in 1988, and his PhD in planetary science at the University of Arizona in 1995. Bill is, has a really eclectic research agenda, and it's always a pleasure to listen to him. It includes the formation and bombardment history of planetesimals, planets and satellites, the origin and evolution of small body populations throughout the solar system, including asteroids, comets, irregular uh, satellites, KBOs. Uh, and uh, meteoroids and dust, and the evolution of Earth uh, near Earth objects, NEOs, from their source regions in various asteroid and cometary populations to their observed orbits uh, that we see today. Bill has a wide range of honors, fellowships, and honors, including being an Eagle Scout, which I never uh, never doubted in my life. Um, Bill has received the Derek P. Kuiper Memorial Award, and he has an asteroid 1995 HN2 named 7355 Baki. Um, and uh, he indeed is very talented and an excellent speaker and always a pleasure to listen to. So let me turn it over to Bill and we'll do our usual. Bill will talk and then we'll have questions and answers. Um, uh, please put them in the chat box and uh, we'll highlight them and then address those when Bill is done. Bill, welcome. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to do this today. It's nice if someone mentioned being an Eagle Scout. I was always proud of that when I was so, okay, so so Jim asked me to give this talk, and he wanted me to talk about lunar bombardment. But it's hard to talk about lunar bombardment and say anything interesting without also talking about planet formation, because the two are put together. And then if you talk about the moon, it makes sense to talk about Mars, because that's another target. That actually, if you're going to understand what's going on, you need to understand both worlds in conjunction with everything that's happening. So there's a lot to talk about. This talk is way too stuffed. I think you're all, your heads are all going to be spinning by the end. Um, I have at least an hour of stuff, um, and so I'm going to jump right in. Um, but we'll we'll go an hour, and then we'll see where we are. And then if we want to go a little bit further, we can, because I have a few more things I can talk about in terms of bombardment over the last two billion years. So, so first of all, just to emphasize this, I, I have sort of an infamous history of talking fast. You're going to see that happens again. But even there, there's simply no way to pack in everything we have in terms of early bombardment and planet formation in one talk. There's just too many things going on. A lot of them are almost going on daily. We're getting changes. And so I'm going to give you sort of a, a state of the field. But because everything is changing so rapidly, I think I'm going to have to just focus on interesting questions and interesting constraints. And I'm going to do that more than trying to give you a bunch of solutions um, because things are just interesting right now, which is really fun. Uh, but it does, does make it complicated to talk about. Okay. So, let me start off with this. This is sort of a nice slide I like to put in, just to kind of give you a little bit of history of, of where I'm coming from with this. So, I was born in 1966. So, I'm just barely old enough to remember some of the Apollo landings. This is where they used to show all, all four television channels, used to show them all day long. And I would watch these things. And this really set the course for my career. I'm probably in planetary science today because of Apollo. Um, so, from my perspective, it's been really sort of, uh, I guess, disappointing to see how the moon has sort of gone from this fascinating, interesting world to a world that's less interesting. You know, only now are we sort of thinking about, again, let's maybe go back to the moon. But even then, the arguments I'm hearing for doing this aren't necessarily the arguments I would use. 
And I would say at some level, in order to convince people the moon is a place that we want to visit, we have to make a case of why we should go back. Okay, and so I'm a scientist, so I'm going to try to make the science case today. So the science case is really interesting, and hopefully after I've given this talk, maybe you'll have a better feeling for why I think the moon is so important. And hopefully it's not just the public that will get this idea, but maybe planetary scientists will get this idea as well if they didn't have it already. Okay, so at the, to the zeroth order, here's what I think. So the reason the moon is fascinating is it's not just because it's an interesting world. If all by itself, it's an interesting world. You can learn a lot about the terrestrial planets and how things differentiate and how you form a crust and all these sorts of things from the moon. But the moon is also interesting because it's something of a Rosetta Stone. If you can understand all its parameters and constraints, I can tell you about two really fascinating things that we don't know much about. First of all, is you can learn something about the unknown nature of the primordial Earth. Okay, so, so something to think about, right, is that when you, we look at the oldest rocks we have on the Earth today, the oldest rocks maybe go back as far as 4 billion years. There's, maybe, there's a few zircons that go further than that. There's some debate about whether a few rocks might go beyond that. But really, we're talking about we're missing on the Earth almost a half a billion years of its history. Okay? And the one place we might be able to pick up some of that history, at least in terms of bombardment, is on the moon. It's possible that history is preserved on that world. Okay? The other issue is that the moon has this very interesting history of bombardment. If we can combine that with all the other constraints we can have, we ultimately can say something about planet formation, which is one of the main goals of planetary science. How did our planets form? How do exoplanets form in the rest? So the moon may tell us about the critical last stages of planet formation, and not necessarily just in the terrestrial planet region, but how planet formation is working across the solar system. And I'll say more about that as we go along. Okay, so part one of this talk is we're gonna talk about planet formation. So this will be a review for some people in the audience, but it's a class. I'm gonna you know, start with a, little, a few basics. Okay, so, a good place to start is to say something about planetesimal formation. So we think our system came from a, a collapsed cloud of gas and dust, it eventually formed a protostar, and then also we have a disk surrounding it that's filled with gas and dust. And so then somehow we have to go from that to a system of planets. So the question is how to do it, and there's this enormous amount of interesting research that's going on with us right now. I can only briefly capture it, and I'm going to try to think, make things simple. So the things I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes are sort of things that are, are sort of maybe hopefully fairly simple to understand, at least some of it. Um, the things that are affecting dust and gas in the disk are gravity, okay? gravitational forces between the particles and the rest. These things can collide with one another, so we have collisions and so And then finally, we have interactions between the solids and the gas, okay? and it, which is turning out to be a really, really important part of the problem. Now, there's other things you could mention here, like magnetic fields and the rest, but I'm gonna skip that for now. Uh, those are interesting, but just there's only so much time to talk. Okay, so what we think happens in broad strokes is at some level in the in the in the solar nebula, in the gas disk, you have dust material, dust particles which are hitting one another at very low velocities. Some of them are sticking. You're actually creating these little uh, fluffy aggregates of material, and eventually uh, this material may form into somewhat larger objects. In fact, we may even get up to objects which are as large as a centimeter and, and possibly even up to a meter. There's some debate about what size our species is. Like. The problem is if you try to go beyond a meter, though, you really run into trouble. Okay, so it, it's, the way to think about this is this. So imagine you're driving down whatever your favorite interstate is, and you're all going 75 miles per hour, and then you decide to slam on the brakes. Okay, so all the cars are going to hit you at really high velocity. That's a little bit what happens when you get beyond a meter in the solar nebula, right? All of a sudden, you start feeling the gas, it's producing a headwind, you start to slow down, and then all the particles that aren't feeling that way are battering you. Okay? There's also the issue that when you get above a meter or so, you start to spiral in towards the sun, and the time scale you go away at is very, is very fast. Right? So both those issues create what's called the meter size barrier. And so we think somehow we have to jump beyond that. So regardless of what particle sizes we have in the, in the, in the planetesimal disk, or in the, in the solar nebula, we have to some way go from small little things up to big things. And that's been a real hurdle we've been trying to overcome for decades in planetary science. Okay. So one of the really interesting advances that's happening is all the work that's being done on how the solar nebula evolves. And a lot of these more really interesting issues are coming down to how does the nebula respond to turbulence? Okay, what's happening in the nebula? This is a really fascinating work done by uh, Johansson et al. And they've, there's lots of other people that have advanced on this. But in essence, what they're saying is that in a gas nebula, you could get turbulence, you can develop eddies, you can develop um, um, essentially concentrations where verticities start to take place. And what happens is particles start to move to where the high pressure zones are. And if you can get a big enough concentration in a given place, 
you can actually, by gravity, essentially allow this material to collapse and you can form a planetesimal. And the latest models I've seen for people like Hoover, Klar, and the rest suggest that a natural size to come out of these models is maybe the order of about 100 kilometers. Okay, so we may go from very small things up to 100, 100 kilometer things and not actually have a lot in the middle. Although, there's, again, there's lots of different models and different debate about them. We might even get objects larger than 100 kilometers. But at some level, that's how we're starting planet formation. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so in broad strokes, what happens after that point is we start to have collisions between fairly large particles. And there's enough collisions where some things will start to form, become larger and still larger. And eventually, we think they grow into objects that are maybe the order of, let's say, our moon or maybe Mars size or so. So we'll call those protoplanets or planetary embryos. Okay? Not everything forms into this right away, but some things do. So the next slide. OK. So this is just a, a fun model, just showing how this process would kind of work. So on the, on the y-axis, you have mass and Earth mass. You can see on Earth mass would be at 1. Then we have semi-major axis. And one of the things I want to emphasize here is that, um, that, that planet formation or accretion is sort of working from the inside out. And the reason is, is that when you're closer to the sun, you're basically, and because of Keplerian shear, you're basically going around the sun faster if you're closer to the sun than you're further away. Okay? What also happens is the density of materials closer to the sun is often much higher. So those two combinations mean you're growing things closer, and then gradually as you go out, you start to form things a little bit further out. Okay, so, so this probably has an effect on, on, a, on what, why our terrestrial planets are the way they are. Okay? And then the question is how do we, you know, how do we use these models in trying to understand what's happening. Okay. So if you take those kind of models, as of about 10 years ago, um, many of the people in the field would have probably given you a simulation. It's going to look something like what I'm going to show you right here. So in this model, they would say, okay, so we've grown our protoplanets, maybe about half the mass of the inner solar system is in protoplanets, maybe moon to Mars size objects. And then we'll put the other mass into some planet tussle. And so what they would do is they would take this model of the late stage of accretion. And they would just want to see what would happen if you turned on gravity and, and just allowed collisions to take place. So I'm going to show you this movie. In this particular simulation, the asteroid belt, you notice, has lots of moon to Mars sized objects in it. And the big blue guy is Jupiter. Let's turn all this on and see what happens. Okay. So the movie should go. Okay. So what's happening here is the embryos are dynamically exciting one another. And they actually, you see, they excite one another completely out of the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt in the process loses a lot of mass, right? So the mass, asteroid belt started off with more mass, it's now depleted. Collisions are taking place in the terrestrial planet region, and eventually that's gonna give a system. While it's not identical to our, our Earth and Venus and all the rest, it's not bad. You know, it's, it's the zeroth order, it's probably okay. So that tells us something about how planet formation is taking place. Even though we're still worrying about all the details, at some level, these models are giving us insights as to how things may have Okay, so one other insight that's useful to come from here, we see that towards the end game, there's still some very big collisions that are taking place. That's going to be important for making our moon. But also you see all these green guys flying around. I'm going to refer to those as leftover planetesimals. So these are objects that physically didn't accrete right away with our system of planets. These objects can continue to bombard the moon and Mars and Earth and Venus um, for some long period of time. Okay, so they are a potential source for some of the impact craters we see on our terrestrial planets, provided those craters are very old. And I just want to emphasize, I don't need to talk much about moon formation, because you had a whole lecture of that from Robin, and she can, she can uh, say all sorts of interesting things. But I just want to point out that making our moon is a natural part of planet formation, of the models you just see. So this is what we would call the canonical impact. This is where you have something roughly the size of Mars hitting the Earth. And I'll just turn on that simulation. You guys have all seen this before. There's a lot, there's a lot more interesting, sophisticated models out there right now. But the zero order, this is kind of nice, right? So what you're seeing here is you're getting a big impact, which is forming a proto-lunar disk. Um, the disk is actually very depleted in iron. Most of the iron is going to the proto-Earth. You actually have a way to get a large moon out of this system. It's going to grow out of this disk. You're going to get a high uh, angle momentum for the Earth-Moon system. You're going to explain why the moon is lacking in iron. And so at some level, we think if we're going to understand how our moon forms, we have to tie it all again into planet formation. So planet formation and moon formation are all coupled together. You can't really solve one without solving the other. Okay, you need to worry about both, which is interesting. Okay, that's as much as I'm going to say about that. Okay, so as I said, as about 10 years ago, we thought we had pretty good um, planet formation models. And I remember telling people in the hallways to say, you know, I think we're I think we're getting close to getting the true answer. And that was 10 years ago, and that was a bad thing to say. I, I don't think I'll ever say that again. Right? But that was really awful. So one of the issues that came out of some of the models we're looking at was this plot I'm showing you here. 
So what you're seeing here is all the black dots represent simulations of planet formation, very much similar to the movie I just showed you. Okay. And then in this, you can see um, Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and Mars. And what you see is you don't do too bad a job of making Earth and Venus. And Mercury even isn't so bad. But what's, what's interesting is that our Mars masses tend to be very high in all of our model simulations compared to what we actually see from Mars. Okay. Mars is surprisingly low mass. Um, so this is this might not be a problem. If some people have argued it's just it's just a random event. So our system is just a chance uh, population that would happen. If you looked at a million different uh, planet formation systems, most of them would have big Marses. We just happen to be small. And that's possible, but I don't think that's truly satisfying to a lot of people. So a lot of us have been looking into what the small mass Mars problem means. Okay? And also what's going on with the asteroid belt at the same time. Okay. So there's another big issue that's come up recently. And I almost didn't put this in, but I just think it's too interesting to not like, discuss it. Again. Okay. And that's this issue of how we interpret meteorites. So I know most of you in the audience aren't, ge aren't geochemists. I am not a geochemist, right? But I just, but I just want you to sort of not worry about all the numbers, but sort of get a feeling for the patterns here. So what's going on is that this is uh, Paul Warren that sort of collected a lot of information from a lot of different people. And he looked at all the different meteorite classes we have. And so you can see here, he's looking at different isotopes of chromium, different isotopes of titanium. And on the right side, you see um, lithium, a word coming from uh, Kruger et al. And what they find is there seems to be very distinct differences between objects that are carbonaceous chondrites, those in, on the left, uh, left slide, those are all the black dots, say CB and CM, CK and all the rest. But there's a big distinction between carbonaceous bodies and things that are, we're going to call non carbonate these would include the eucrites, these would include the ordinary chondrites, the urolites, all sorts of things. And there's such a strong difference between these two meteorite classes that it's been suggested that it's really hard to think about these classes forming in sort of the same part of the solar system. You can imagine trying to make them all in the asteroid belt. But if they're all being made in the asteroid belt, why wouldn't there be more, let's say, of a, a connection between the two? Why wouldn't we see sort of transition objects which are sort of half, um, let's say, non-carbonaceous and half carbonaceous? How do they stay separate? This has really been puzzling to um, the, the meteoriticists, but also I think the dynamicists. Okay? So this really seems to be an issue. Okay? And so an interesting solution was recently put forward by uh, Alessandro Morbidelli. And he suggested this really interesting idea. that let's assume for the moment that all the non-carbonaceous material we have formed, let's say, in the terrestrial planet region, or in, let's say, in the asteroid belt. And then in the outer solar system, let's assume that's where all of our carbonaceous material that would, and so then, well, why don't they mix? Well, one reason they might not mix is because Jupiter reaches uh, a good size. As Jupiter forms, it eventually reaches maybe 20 Earth masses and eventually gets bigger, but it cuts off communication between those two groups, right? So this would give you a natural way to explain this very distinct difference we have between these meteorite groups. And it's sort of an elegant way to solve problems, but it leaves us with a major issue. And that major issue is, how do we get carbonaceous stuff that's in the outer solar system into the asteroid belt where we see it today? You know, is there a way to solve that problem? So these two problems, the small mass Mars and this issue of where the non-carbonaceous and carbonaceous objects come from, is a big deal. And planetary scientists are, are working right now to try to figure out these problems. And so you're wondering, well, what are we going to start talking about bombardment? We're going to get there, but these problems are all related. Okay, so, okay. so how, is, how do we get solve the small mass Mars problem? How do we get carbonaceous stuff in the asteroid belt from the outer solar system? So one possible way to do this is with something that's called the Grand Tack. Okay? This was developed by uh, Kevin Walsh, who's the lead author, but also Andrew Morbidelli and a host of others are on it. And I'm going to show this with a movie, and I'm not going to spend a lot of detail because i got to cover a lot of ground here. But the way to think about it is this. Right? So imagine you're looking at an early version of our solar system where there is still gas around because you're still dealing with the solar nebula. So in the inner solar system, where you see S-class planetesimals, that might be a little too specific. Let's just for the moment think of that as non-carbonation. So, so Jupiter is going to start growing and getting to a larger size, and then it's going to start interacting with the disk. As it interacts with the disk, it's going to ultimately be in a position to start to migrate. And so it's going to start to migrate inward. And Saturn's going to start to do the same thing. Okay? And eventually, as they migrate inward, those two are going to get caught in resonance with one another. And could collectively, their gravitational interactions with one another and the gas disk, once they're in resonance, it's going to cause Jupiter and Saturn to stop moving inward and then start to move back outward. So with that explanation, let's take a look at the moon. Okay, we'll start here in just a second. Okay, so here's Jupiter moving inward. You can see Saturn's kind of growing and catching up to it. Eventually, at some point, they get caught together. Then they start to interact with the disk in a different way. 
And here you're changing the scale so you can see what happens in the outer solar system. So Jupiter and Saturn had migrated across the asteroid belt. Now they're going to migrate back. Okay? And in the process, they're going to inject into the asteroid belt not only a bunch of non-carbonaceous material, but a bunch of carbonaceous material as well. Okay? So this is one possible way that we could get carbonaceous and non-carbonaceous material in the asteroid belt. And this model does a really nice job of giving us a small mass Mars. Okay? So but if this model is right, then you see all these leftover planetesimals flying around. They may provide the source for lots of really bombardment. Okay, so this could be a model that we need to take seriously in terms of understanding the Moon and Mars. So we're going to go forward from there. So here's uh, sort of the final frame from the early days. And you'll notice that the asteroid belt is dynamically pretty excited. And there's some ways actually to get it less excited, and I'm going to talk about those in just a bit. So this is not the end story in terms of migration and everything else that's going on in the inner solar system. But it's an interesting first step. So I'm going to call this step phase one. Okay, there's another phase that's coming. All right. So that's so as of let's say just from a few years ago, that's probably the only solution we had to get carbonaceous material from the outer solar system into the asteroid belt and the rest. Okay. And this model did such a nice job that we were sort of thinking, well, this might be a good solution. But recently there's been some interesting things happening that suggest maybe there's a rival. Okay. We're, we're still in the early stages here, but the stages are really exciting. Okay, so I want to talk about that now. And that has to do with um, what actually happens in the outer solar system as the giant planets are forming. So we have to start worrying about gas drag effects. Okay. So also I'm going to talk about something which is also very important for planet formation. Um, I'm only going to briefly touch on it here, but I would say at the moment it's maybe one of the most important processes, at least in terms of the new way we're thinking about planet formation. That is, that's something called pebble accretion. Okay. So, so let's talk about that. First, let's, let's, let's give you an idea what you're looking at. Imagine I create some object. And it's, let's say, a centimeter in size. could be a decimeter in size, but it's small, right? And we're going to have it go by a protoplanet. And in this case, we'll have no gas around. So what happens is you just see that the trajectory is, ch is changed by gravity. That's it, right? Nothing else happens. Okay? Now we're going to add gas into the picture. And the size of the particle is such that it actually feels a little bit of headwind from the solar nebula. And so that headwind causes some drag. In this particular case, you can see this particle sort of spirals into its depth, depth or depth. So what happens is, if you can think about this, this protoplanet all of a sudden has gone from having a fairly small accretion radius to a very large accretion radius. And so if you have enough pebbles in the solar nebula, this protoplanet can go from something that's fairly small all the way up to something very big, and it can actually do, stuff, do it fairly rapidly. So this is what's known as pebble accretion. And again, there's all sorts of interesting papers coming out dealing with this. Um, I can't even touch on all the interesting things going on, but I think uh, if uh, some of the people listening to this are students, I think over the next decade or so, a, a lot of what you're going to be seeing in planet formation is almost always going to involve pebble accretion. Okay. So a few years ago, uh, I was involved with a paper with Hal Levison, where they tried looking at some of the implications for pebble accretion for making terrestrial planets, for making the giant planets. So what you're looking at here are two different simulations. One is for the inner solar system, one is for the outer solar system. Uh, the, the simulations don't uh, talk to one another, so Jupiter is not influencing anything into your in inner solar system. And on the, on the y-axis, we have mass and Earth masses. So if things get higher on the plot, they get more massive, right? So what's interesting is that sort of you play some interesting games with how pebble accretion works. And I won't go into all the details of what's happening here. But ultimately, you see is that you can start to grow fairly large bodies. And what's exciting is you can actually, at least for the outer solar system, you can grow bodies fast enough that they don't have time to really scatter one another. This has been a big problem in terms of making the cores of the giant planets. So you can actually make the cores of the giant plants in short enough order that then they can grab a lot of gas and get what we see. In the inner solar system, you're seeing that pebble accretion has the potential to make bodies like Earth and Venus and the rest. And depending on what's going on, you might be able to use these kind of processes to make a small Mars. Okay? You might even be able to make a low-mass asteroid. Belt. There's lots of different things going on. We're going to see what happens. But this is one other possible system of solution that might take place. Okay? All right. So how does this? How do we deal then with getting the carbonaceous material from the outer solar system to the inner solar system? Okay, so Sean Raymond and his colleague Isidoro had a uh, paper out last year, and we have a paper that's uh, more or less in press. Pretty close. We have to get the referee report. Kind of shocked, but ultimately this was led by Catherine Craigie. And the idea here is we're going to just look at what's going on in the giant planet. So here you're going to see a simulation with all the cores of the giant planets forming by pebble accretion. But in the process, they're going to be exciting plant decimals around them. We'll sort of start this movie and then you get a chance to see what's going on here. Okay, so, so the cores of the giant plants are growing. They're starting to scramble up planetesimals out there. And you can see the planetesimals going all over the place. But if it's interesting, if you look carefully, because the gas is still around, 
material is being handed down to Jupiter. But then it's actually escaping Jupiter's clutches because of gas drag. Okay, so, and in fact, you see a, a part here where Jupiter starts to grab its gas, it gets very large, and a lot of material actually finds a way to make its way into the asteroid belt. So if this is right, this provides an alternative way to get material that's carbonaceous into the asteroid belt and into the inner solar system, and you don't need uh, the Grand Tack. Okay, it's another possibility. Okay, so again, we don't know if it's right, but it's something interesting to think about. So here's like another way we could possibly do the same thing. So you know, dynamicists tend to be creative, not always right, but at least we're trying to be innovative. So okay, there we go. So here's what you see. So yeah, we have this would suggest that we can get all sorts of things from the outer solar system into the asteroid belt, and maybe that's a way to explain what we see. Okay. So the second phase of all this. So, so we have sort of two competing scenarios right now. Okay. Each developed to a different degree. But then there's another portion that has to happen. Here. And this is what I'm going to refer to as phase two. Phase two is where the giant plants undergo what's called an instability. And I'll describe that a little bit. Okay. So this, this what we call the giant plant instability has another sort of name that we call it. And we often call this the Nice model. Okay. The reason we call it the Nice model is it was developed in East France. It was developed by four people, uh, Hal Levison, Alessandro Morbidelli, Rodney Gomez, and Clementa Saganis. They were working at the observatory of Nice. And this is a picture from the observatory. So I like to joke, you know, it's, it's amazing to get any work done there at all because they have these incredible views, and the food is good, and the wine is good, you know, so how do you get anything done? Okay, but essentially, they did decide to do work. And at the time they were dealing with this about a decade ago, they were trying to solve the following issue. Okay, so, so as long as I've been in the field and I've been playing around with planet formation, um, for a long time we were trying to make the giant, all the plants, especially the giant plants, where we see them today. Okay? You're trying to make Uranus where you see it today, you're trying to make Neptune where you see it today. It turns out that's really, really hard to get to work. Okay? Making Uranus and Neptune where we see them is difficult because by the time you grow a, a core that is large enough to grab the gas, the gas is completely gone. But there's other more interesting, there's other interesting problems as well. Jupiter and Saturn are not on circular orbits, but gas, model, gas accretion models predict they should be on completely circular orbits. Their, their orbits are actually slightly inclined and slightly eccentric. If you go to the Kuiper Belt, today we have a Pluto out there and we have an Eris out there. But the total mass of the Kuiper Belt is maybe in the order of about a Mars mass. Okay? That's not enough material to actually make those objects. Okay? So we have some real problems. And so people have been suffering with these problems for decades. And then the Nice group, in the process of trying to solve things in the Kuiper Belt, decided to do something uh, kind of innovative. And they said, well, let's, let's, for the moment, just for fun, let's assume the giant plants didn't form where we see them today. Jupiter probably formed pretty close to where it is. To, but Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune formed at maybe about half their current distance. So we have a very different configuration here. So the giant plants didn't form between 5 and 30 AU. They formed between about, say, about 5 and maybe you know, 17 to 20 AU or so. And then beyond that, we don't have this puny disk of comet. So we actually have the order of 20 Earth masses or even more of material out there. Okay? So the advantage to this is all of a sudden now, because Uranus and Neptune are closer to the sun, you can make them more rapidly. So now you have a chance of making your cores and getting your gas at a reasonable time scale. In the primordial disk of comets, you have enough mass to make a Pluto, but not just a few Plutos, you can make maybe a thousand Plutos or so. So you have lots and lots of Plutos. So you can make everything, which is great, but this system doesn't look like ours. Okay, so what do you do? So they decided to numerically model this. So this is uh, a sort of the classic version of this model. So here the giant plants are on all circular orbits. They're surrounded by this big massive disk. The system is stable for some period of time, and then eventually it goes unstable. That's what you see. Okay. So what's happened here is that that disk that's surrounding the giant plants has been losing mass. Ever so, slow, ever so slightly. And that's been causing the giant plants to migrate ever so slightly. And eventually they take, this goes on until instability is reached. And then what happens is Neptune is actually forced to enter into the disk. It migrates through the disk. And then it creates the system you see today. So all the giant plants have migrated. We've eliminated most of the mass from this uh, primordial disk. And this model, interestingly enough, can do a lot of interesting things for us. So on the right side, I'm showing us some, some simulations from a paper by David Nisforti and Alessandro Morbidelli where they ran a bunch of different versions of this. And, and, and I won't get into all the details of this, but ultimately their models are able to reproduce the orbits of the giant planets in all their parameters, inclination, semi-dure axis, and eccentricity. In fact, today it's the only model still that can do this. There's no other model on the playing field that can reproduce these giant planets, orbits the way they are. So for that reason, this is why we keep feeding on this model, because we don't have anything else that can replace it. But there's also this. For the last maybe 13 years, we've been looking at all the different aspects of the NIST model. And a lot of times these, these problems come up, you think you're gonna kill it in one way or the other. But then we look more deeply into it and it finds out 
that actually the NIST model is teaching us something about the solar system. We can now use the NIST model to explain why we have Trojan asteroids. We can use it to explain why we have a regular satellite. It can explain why the Kuiper belt has the distribution it has. It can explain all sorts of aspects of the asteroid belt. You can keep going on and on. It's an amazingly powerful model. It's been a lot of fun to uh, do things with. Okay. So one thing you're going to notice with this model here is that you notice that the NIST nice model instability happens many hundreds of billions of years after the system starts. And so when the original, when the, uh, when the authors of this uh, came out with this model, it seemed like, hey, this might be a great way to make late basins on the moon. Maybe this is a source of what we call the late heavy bombardment, which I'll be talking about later in the talk. Okay? So that was ideally one of the things that we came up with. And I've done a lot of work suggesting that maybe that's the best way to fit the strengths. Okay? But very recently, uh, we published a paper with David this morning, I believe, which actually is sort of, you know, David's really good and he forced me, he forced me to change my mind on it. Okay? So what you're looking at is a binary that's uh, in the Trojan population. Uh, the binary is called Patroclus, and its companion is called Venetius. Okay? They're both about 100 kilometer bodies, and they're separated by almost 700 kilometers or so. It's actually one of the targets of the Lucy mission, which Hal Levison is, uh, is the PI of, and it's going to launch here in a few years. Okay. So the reason this binary is interesting okay, is that we think it had to come from the primordial disk. Okay. And we don't, you know, the, the Trojans that are captured are just a small fraction of the disk. So the thinking is that there must have been a lot more binaries of this nature back in that primordial disk. Right? So, so David asked the question, okay, so let's assume we have a big primordial disk and you have a lot of binaries in it. How long can those binaries survive? Because we need this, enough binaries to survive long enough so eventually a few can get captured in the Trojans, or at least one gets captured in the Trojans, so we can get this object. Okay? So what I'm showing here in this slide, though, is sort of uh, one of the results from the paper we just did. So the green line shows where the patroclus magnesius binary is in terms of separation, but separated by almost 700 kilometers. And so let's assume that everything that we have in the primordial disk is binary. Okay, so let's start with 100% binary. That's where the one is. And then let's wait 100 million years. What happens after 100 million years is small little impacts in the disk are hitting these binaries, and they're changing their angular momentum. And so they, sometimes angular momentum may actually make your orbits bigger. Sometimes it may make it smaller. Sometimes you may actually strip the components from one another. Sometimes it may cause the binaries to collide. But the longer you sit in the disk, the more things that can happen that, are, that ultimately is bad for you. Okay? So what David found is that if you wait 100 million years, only about 10% of your original population of binaries are still there. Okay? You wait 200 million years, then you're down to about 1%. And it keeps going this way. Okay? And ultimately, what he decided is that the only way you could sort of allow yourself to have enough binaries around to capture one of the Trojans is to say that the primordial disk had to go away fairly early. Okay? And so that seems like a strong result. Um, it could be wrong, but I think the arguments behind it are pretty solid. So if this is right, it says that we can't wait 500 million years to have the primordial disk go away. It has to go away fairly early. Okay? And at, at some level, that might even make sense, right? Because systems that want to go unstable, go unstable, right? They don't always wait around for a really long time. So we'll see how this pans out. But at the moment, I think David's made a really nice argument. So that, this also leads to another really exciting paper that's come out recently that um, I just saw for the first time maybe a couple months ago. And I, I they're, 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 anyway, it's interesting enough that I wanted to talk about it a bit. So imagine now you have like a very early planetary instability. So all the things I, I said in phase one just happened, but we still have to have the NIST model to explain all the things we have in the outer solar system. But rather than have the, the NIST model wait, let's have it happen during planet formation. Let's just have it happen in the middle of the simulation that I was showing you very early in the talk and see what happens. So this is the work that Clement et al. just recently published. And so what they did is they said, let's assume this instability happens, let's say 10 million years in. So I'm going to start a simulation here and you'll see what happens. So, so you have this system of plan formation, which is not very different from what we saw before. Then all of a sudden what you're going to see is the system gets very excited from the instability. Okay? Now, what this does is this, this all, uh, this whole process adds an extra level of excitation to the inner solar system. And so you're actually getting rid of some of the mass that's close to where Mars is today. This system actually has an easier time getting a small Mars, get rid of a lot of the asteroid belt in the same fashion because uh, the, the instability is affecting the asteroid belt at some level. You have lots of interesting objects flying around that could be useful for bombardment. And what's really fascinating to me about this model is it seems to do a pretty good job, surprisingly good job, of giving us the planetary system we see today it gives us a Mars that's excited and low mass. It gives us a Mercury, which is also dynamically excited. The orbits of Earth and Venus are about right. Um, it's not a perfect model. I think there's a lot more sophistication we can add to this and probably have to add to this 
But the fact that we're able to do this and get such a good solution, I think, is very encouraging. So maybe this is another model that we can think about. Okay. And so the spec simulation what I'm showing here is remember I talked about how we can get uh, carbonaceous material in the asteroid belt from gas ray. Well, that would create an asteroid belt, which is very dynamically cold. So it would look a lot like what you're seeing right now. You see an asteroid belt that everything's low eccentricity, everything's low inclination. But that's not the way the asteroid belt looks today. So what I'm going to show you here is some work that's done by Ruggiero De Niro, who we just hired, who's doing really neat stuff. And he's going to show you how an early NICE model can get the asteroid belt excited. Okay, so the big action happens at about 5.5 million years ago. So just about to go. And there we go. But what's happening here is the giant plants are all migrating, but they're also jumping around at the same time. And this process gives you an asteroid belt, which is dynamically very excited. Okay, so at the same time, you're actually losing mass from the asteroid belt. So this provides yet another source of bombardment. And we're still in early days, but at least to zero, you know, at least at, at the early time we're looking at right now, this kind of excitation combined with the other models we have, again, might prove to be a rival for the grand tax. So I think it's something we really need to investigate at some level. We'll see how it works out. So the next animation I'm going to show you is this is just how that asteroid belt evolves over billions of years. Okay. So we start off with an asteroid belt that's dynamically excited. It starts to lose a lot of mass. And on the right side of your screen, you're looking at sort of uh, these blue objects versus red objects. The red objects are the real asteroid belt. The blue objects, I think, are the model, or could be reversed, I forget which. But to any event, the point is, is that the final asteroid belt you get from this is surprisingly good. Okay. So that, again, as Bing suggests, that this is the way we need to go if we want to explain early bombardment. Okay. So one other issue that I think is important to bring up here, and that has to do with the impact rates. So, so far I've just talked about a bunch of models, what is all this mean? But there's something that I think is important to keep in mind when you're thinking about bombardment of the moon or thinking about Mars. Okay. So, so when we model asteroids coming out of the asteroid belt, and we look at how often do they hit Mars versus how often do they hit moon. For most asteroids just overall, it, it, it turns out that asteroids are much more likely to hit Mars than the moon. It's about a 10 to 1 ratio. Okay? Comets are more like a 3 to 1 ratio. And then leftover planetesimals, depending on how you define that term, but if we talk about things in the terrestrial planet region, the ratio might be, let's say, 2 to 1 or maybe even 1 to 1, depending on, on different things. Okay? So that has a huge effect on how we interpret our impacts in the intersolar system. But there's one other issue which I think is really important. Okay? This is something I think that we definitely need to understand. So right now, all our chronology uh, that we have for solar, for, for Mars, for Venus, for everything is, or sorry, not for Venus, but uh, for everything that we have is based on, on the moon. Okay? We have samples from the moon. We've used that to date things. Okay? But if right now, all the chronologies assume that asteroids are the main bombardment population that's hitting the moon and Mars the rest, they use this 10 to 1 ratio. Okay? If leftover planetesimals are the main population hitting the moon and Mars, that all of our chronology that we use for the early times to get ages on the moon, or excuse me, ages on Mars and the rest are wrong. Okay? And we need to redefine all of that. That's just something to keep in mind. It's very possible that, like, where people have said that uh, something on Mars, let's say, might be 3.7 billion years old or 3.8 billion years old, it actually might be older, depending on what kind of planetesimal or what kind of objects are hitting Mars. That matters a lot. Okay. So, just a quick summary for the first part of the talk, okay, is that. Um, these models make very different bombardment populations, and which one is right depends on the nature of the constraints. Okay? And the rest of this just suggests uh, some different things that go on with, uh, or basically how the uh, early yeast model might have a big effect on planet formation, but we still have some predictions coming from the Grand Tack. There's a recent paper out there, and I'll talk more about that in just a bit. So there's a lot of interesting things going forward here. Okay. Now I better jump into constraints. That's really what I'm supposed to be talking about this talk, but I wanted to set the stage. Okay. So, just recently, we had a bombardment workshop just talking about all the interesting things that were happening on different worlds in terms of bombardment. And a lot has changed over the last 10 years. There's no possible way I can communicate everything that's going on. Okay? So I'm just going to try to give you a sort of bottom line, stripped down version of the history of bombardment of the moon and what people are currently thinking. Okay. Well, first of all, the reason we study the moon okay, is it's got the most complete and clear history available of the last four and a half billion years of solar system. If you really want to understand what's going on with the end of planet formation, maybe the best place to look is possibly the moon, especially like especially the far side. Of the moon, which I'll talk about in a bit. Okay. So if you look at the moon from these gorgeous images from uh, from LRO, what you uh, can sort of see here is there's all sorts of giant impact craters on it. Anything larger than about 300 kilometers, we call a basin. 
sort of historical. And the estimates suggest that there's on the order of about 40 lunar basins, and they formed somewhere on the moon between about 3.7 billion years ago and four and a half billion years ago. And when precisely they formed has been this huge ongoing debate since the Apollo era. Okay. So if you go back to the Apollo time and read a lot of the Apollo era literature, essentially the story that often emerges is something like this, is that when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon and brought back samples, they returned many um, impact melts and other shock rocks. And a lot of the ages they brought back were very close to 3.9 billion years ago. Somewhere between about 3.8 and let's say about 4 billion years ago. Okay. And so various papers said, well, this is very interesting. This maybe suggests that something very dramatic was happening at that particular time. Okay? In fact, it was also argued that we, from all the estimates we had from various missions, that we actually had ages for a lot of basins on the moon. Okay? We had all these different basins, you see Imbrium and Serenitatis and Christian and Nectars, and all their ages were pretty close to 3.9. Okay? And so to many people, it was argued that maybe this suggests some kind of impact spike that happened close in time to that, to that time. Okay? So, in terms of an impact spike, sometimes people show it off like this. This would be the blue curve you can see here. This is often referred to as a terminal cataclysm. Here I'm showing off some uh, uh, a line from Stuart Robbins. Stuart's not an advocate of terminal cataclysm, but if you sort of take some of his crater counts he gets and you just put in some of the ages people have for the samples, you get the blue line you see. And so it's sort of demonstrable of what we, what we have. There's also other people that have argued that there is no terminal cataclysm. There's much more sort of this declining bombardment, the sort of tail from accretion. So impact rates were very high early on, gradually faded away. And what we're looking at with all these young, all these similar ages is just uh, sort of a brick wall. But if you go back in time, you just can't see very far back in time. So you're only seeing the younger basins. So that was a huge debate that went on for decades. And at some level, it's still echoing, although, although the story is changing. Okay, so here's a picture of sort of the entire moon. And this shows where all the Apollo samples were taken from. All the blue stars you see are different Apollo missions, Apollo 12, 14, such. But you also see some of the Luna missions from uh, the former Soviet Union. They have, uh, they took samples close to Christian base and the rest. Okay, so since, I would say, let's say, I would say maybe like the last 15 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, we've put a lot of reanalysis of all the Apollo samples. And more and more, I think a lot of the community is growing to this idea that when Imbrium was formed, Imbrium is one of the youngest basins and one of the biggest basins on the moon that gets ejected may have contaminated a lot of the near side with debris. Okay? So really what happens is Imbrium is close to 3.9 billion years old. And what's happened is that samples have contaminated all these sites. So when we see 3.9 billion years all over the place, really we're just sampling Imbrium again and again and again. Now, it's not clear that's true, but that's what a lot of the geochemists make some good arguments for. And I think it has to be taken seriously. For all we know, Serenitatis and Christium and Nectaris are close in age to Imbrium, but we can't say for certain based on the samples we have today. So I think it's an open question. Okay, so what can we really say then about the bombardment of the moon if you sort of take this more minimalist model? Okay? So what you could say is this, is that the oldest basin we can see with our eyes on the moon is this one called salt pole Asian, Okay, We do not know its age. Okay? All we can say is it's probably older than by, by superposition than anything where we have a reasonable age. So it's older than about 3.9. But whether it's 4.1, whether it's 4.5, we simply can't say. Okay? The two bases I would argue we have some age information on, and again, if I'm sort of taking a minimalist view of this, is the basins Imbrium and Oriental. Okay? Imbrium, I think we dated reasonably well from a bunch of different chronometers, from a bunch of different samples, but there are those that disagree. We just had a bombardment workshop and had some discussion on that. But I think that it, I think the 3.9 ages are just too pervasive to say that we haven't dated Imbrium. Okay? And then Oriental, from a stratigraphy standpoint, is younger than Imbrium. Okay? We can we can date it between Imbrium and other samples where we have confirmed ages. So its age is probably in the ballpark of about let's say 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. So if you think about it, these are uh, the two bases I just mentioned, Imbrium and Oriental. Those are two of the three largest basins on the moon. Those are two of the youngest bases we have on the moon. So it does suggest something big might have been happening in that time scale. But it's also only two events we can't say for certain. But another thing to keep in mind if you're thinking about like what does the late heaven bombardment mean? So the ratio of impacts on the moon compared to that of the Earth is that for every one thing that hits the moon, about 20 hit the Earth. So if you have two Imbrium and Oriental sized basins, 1,000 kilometer basins on the moon, you should have about 40 on the Earth. And so regardless of how you cut it, that's going to be something of a late-head bombardment. And that's going to have a big effect on astrobiology and some of the things and how we interpret samples. So something to keep in mind 
regardless of how the story goes forward. Okay. There's also been some studies of meteorites. Meteorites are, are they sort of get us out of this trap of looking at Imbrium ejecta or possibly looking at Imbrium ejecta. There's been a lot of analysis of shock degassing ages from groups, let's say, that may become objects that may become from VESA. These are called the Howardites, Eucrites, and Diogenites. We've also had um, shock ages looked at from the H chondrates. These are a type of ordinary chondrate. Um, there's a lot I could say on this, but I'm going to keep going here. Essentially, both these groups, which have a fairly large number of shock rocks, at the moment, based on the samples we have, they suggest an interesting pattern. They suggest a lot of impacts around four and a half billion years ago. Then there's sort of a time when we don't have a lot of shock ages. Then there's a lot of shock ages that sort of start around four and then last for a couple hundred million years or so. Okay. Um, it's possible these, uh, this pattern is also seen on the moon, although there's lots of debate about biases on the moon. Um, there's also possible we just haven't done enough statistics and when we get more shocked rocks, eventually we'll fill in the lull. But at, at the zeroth order, this could suggest that maybe something interesting was happening at four, maybe something interesting was happening at four and a half, and maybe not much was happening in the interim. And we'll see if that ends up working out. Okay, so one way to explain the shock degassing agent would be this, uh, this sort of hybrid model we came up with a couple years ago called the sawtooth. That's the green curve you see right there. So the idea of this is that you had, let's say early on, sort of the leftovers of accretion hitting the world. And they were, but they didn't maybe did hit very long. Maybe they hit for a couple hundred million years and then stopped. But then there was maybe not much going on. And then at some later time, you had a late instability, a late giant planet instability, which would give you a lot of impacts. So this model, I thought, did a nice job of explaining a lot of constraints. The problem is now is we may not be able to use a late instability anymore to solve our problems. So this model may not work anymore. We may not be able to use it. Uh, so I pointed out for historical purposes, and so, but still, there might be some evidence that maybe something is happening in early time. It just probably is not a giant planet that's built. We'll see where that goes. Okay, so when we start talking about the moon, there's also this issue of when did the moon form, and also when did this magma ocean actually reach a point where you could actually start to preserve impact on its surface that we can still see today. Okay, that's a huge issue. Okay? So. The moon, uh, the moon right now is thought to have formed somewhere in the neighborhood of, let's say, 60 million years after the first solids, although there's debate about that. Some people want to go longer, some people want to go shorter. 60 million years is an often thrown around number. When the moon magma ocean reached the point where you could actually allow samples, to, or excuse me, impact craters to be served on the surface, is another hugely debated topic. Some people argue that the moon basically wouldn't have preserved anything until about, let's say, 200 million years after it formed. Other people say the magma ocean solidified pretty quickly after the moon formed, and so then you could have impacts uh, recorded almost right away. And at the moment, and I, I don't think anybody has won this argument. It's an argument that's ongoing, and we're still trying to understand it. Okay. So there's other issues that also raise complications as well, and that has to do with the near side of the moon. So this figure is from a is from a work by Jeff Andrews Hanna. So he used a Grail information, which I usually heard about from Maria Zuber's uh, class. A couple, a couple uh, weeks ago. So he looked at the near side of the moon, and what he found is that this big area on the near side we often call Procolarum. And some people have even said maybe it's a basin. It looks like a big circular feature. What he found is when he looked at it with real gravity gradient, that essentially it looks like a giant square. Okay? It looks like big, mag big magmatic rifts that have formed on the near side. Uh, the argument as to how this forms is that for some reason, and no one understands why at the moment, the near side may have had a higher concentration of radioactive elements. And as they started to heat up, they made the near side of the moon much hotter, and it probably erased most of the older terrain. Okay, so all we see now are younger terrains on the near side of the moon. And Katarina Milkovich also used this argument to say that this could explain why some basins, like Serenitatis, like Imbrium, are just seem to be larger than some of the basins on the far side. It's because those impacts formed into a much hotter terrain. Okay, that's a really interesting idea that does a good job of explaining what we see. But what this means, though, is if you want to see the oldest impacts, or want to understand the oldest impacts on the moon, you don't want to look at the near side, although that's an important part of the story. You want to go to the far side. So what I'm showing you here are all of the 150-kilometer craters we have on the moon on both the near side and far side. But the, I'm focusing here on the far side. So you can see that really big circle you see is South Pole Lake Basin and a lot of others here. And so what I did is I took, and this is all work done, done by Grail. This is all from uh, Greg Newman's recent paper on this and, and the Grail team. And so what I did is I took, um, uh, uh, basically calculated where, where are the highest crater spatial density for impacts on the moon based on these 150-kilometer craters. 
And when I found, like I was, I was going to show this, but it's just easier to draw it by hand. I basically get this kind of region that you get. This is basically, these are where you see the highest density of 150 kilometer craters on the moon. It's actually a pretty good match, I was interested to find, between the geologic mapping work that's been done on what we call pre-nectarian terrains. It actually does a pretty good job of matching some of the work that Fassett and Head did when they looked, just looked at smaller craters, like 20 kilometer craters and the rest. Okay? So these are the oldest terrains on the moon, younger terrains. Uh, like you can see, there's, a, there's some bases that are sort of cut out there, you know, like Oriental and the rest. They simply just don't have a very high density of craters around them, and they tend to be younger. Okay? So if we take these craters and we plot them up, Okay, so here I'm plotting them on a, a size distribution. We have cumulative number versus diameter. If we just take all those craters and we plot them up, we get that particular blue figure. And then if I take another region where Simone Markey a few years ago counted one of the most densely cratered populations on the moon, that's on the far side. It kind of makes a chevron-like feature. If you scale them both to the total surface area of the moon, you get this shape. And what's really interesting about this shape is it's not what we expected. What it does is it seems to have, it, it shows the slope of about a minus two cumulus. And what's interesting about that is that that's not a figure that's been often been suggested in the literature. Many people have suggested that the impacts we should see on the far side should look a lot like the asteroid belt. So I, this, this insert uh, plot you see is what the asteroid belt size distribution looks like. You can see it's kind of between 10 and 100 kilometers, it's kind of shallow. And then below 10 kilometers, it gets pretty steep to about a minus three. So it's got kind of a shallow steep pattern. That's not what we're seeing on the far side, okay? So the question is, what are we seeing on the far side? And I think that's a really big, interesting question. Um, I have a sneaking suspicion it might be related to comets, but we're gonna see how that pans out. Maybe it's leftover planetesimals. Maybe it's a combination of a bunch of populations. I think that's something we're gonna still have to wait and see what happens. Okay, so recently, Alex Evans, who uh, just was hired at Brown, published a, a really neat paper with a lot of others on the trail team. And they sort of looked at the same issue they were looking at, they were using, uh, let's say, 90 kilometer craters, which they think from Grail they could find all across the moon. And so here I'm showing a plot from their work. And you can sort of see the far, I just, I'm calling this far side. There's more detail I could put in. But what they're finding is not terribly different from what I'm finding. They're finding something that's very close to about a minus two cumulus down to, let's say, about 40 kilometer craters or so. And then it kind of goes shallow. And the near side of the moon seems to have this much steeper population that then breaks it breaks goes to a shallow slope at a much uh, smaller size, maybe let's say 70, 80 kilometers or so. Um, there's some subtleties I could talk about in this plot, but I want to keep moving. But the zeroth order, it seems like the far side and the near side may have had different impact for populations hitting them. Or at the very least, you could say the far side's older. It saw a different population that the near side is not recording. Uh, we'll see if that's true, but it's an interesting way to think about the problem. Okay. One more thing I want to say about the Alice Evans work. And that's basically, um, these are some, just some absolute comps. What they did is they identified all of the 90 kilometer craters that existed on the moon. And then what they did is they said, how many do we have per million square kilometers? And so they called this number N90. And what they found on the far side is that the oldest terrains on the far side have about 16 90 kilometer craters uh, over time. But the near side only has about 11 per million square kilometers. And so that again proves that the near side is much younger than the far side. That makes sense with everything I've just described. But one interesting thing they said in their paper, though, is they said that the, near, the age of the near side might be very similar to 4.35. And they based that on the idea that we have a lot of samples with 4.35 billion year ages we found on the moon. Uh, they even suggested this could be uh, the formation of the creep reservoir, or what they call the Ur creep that we have on the near side. If that's right, and the near side is 4.35, that means from this model, the far side has to be older. Okay? But how much older, we can't really say. So, we can also play, they can also play the same game for bases like Imbrium and, and Renatatus and Oriental and the rest. You'll see that Imbrium has about six 90 kilometer craters on it per million square kilometers. And that's not terribly different than Renatatus. So if one wanted to make an argument that a lot of the big basins that used to be things thought of 3.9 are at least modestly close in age to Imbrium, you could make that arg argument from superposition okay, of, uh, of craters. The problem is, is that it could be that they're separated in age by 200 million years and we don't know. Okay, so they could be close in age. They're certainly closer in age than, let's say, Imbrium is to the near side terrain or the far side terrain, if you take the whole ensemble. But we still don't quite know what those ages are. So there's some interesting information here, but we still need samples to really figure out what's going on. Okay, so I just want to point out one other issue here in terms of preservation. Okay, so let's assume we have a whole bunch of different models, and we're just saying these models are hitting the moon over given time. Okay, so when does recorded history start? 
Okay, well, on the far side of the moon, you have to account for when the moon formed and then when did this magma ocean close. Okay, so that means erasure happens at some point. So you're not recording every last object that happened during the planet formation era. But when it starts makes a big difference as to how to interpret which model might be giving you a good solution. Okay? So this is the far side. So is the far side four and a half billion years old? Is 4.35 billion years old? That matters for the solution. Okay? If we go to the near side, we know the near side is younger than the far side. But is the near side 4.35 billion years old? Is it 4.2 billion years old? Is it some younger age? And how much has been hidden on the near side? How do we tell that story? Okay? This is a big part of, I think, the future work on the moon, is trying to put our bombardment models we have, our planet formation models with bombardment models, but also worrying about these kind of constraints as to when recorded time started on these different sides of the moon. Okay. And then finally, can we assume that, the three, that we have the two of the three largest basins forming on the moon because they happened young? Was there something interesting happening late on the moon? Is that consistent? That, that would be consistent with what we see in the meteorite. If it's not a late instability, what is it? Or is it just a bias? Are we making a mistake? Are we not interpreting things correctly? I think that's a big issue for the future as well. Okay. So um, let me just ask the, the moderators. We're coming up on an hour. Uh, do, we, do I still have time to keep going? Press on, Bill. Press on. Okay. I'm sorry. I, uh, it took me a little bit longer to get to this point, but we're going to keep going. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about Mars. Okay, so so until recently, I haven't really understood Mars from a bombardment perspective. Uh, but Mars is a very ancient world. And so if you're going to understand bombardment, it helps to have, you know, it's better to look at two worlds rather than just one. And so Mars was also hit by the same population of asteroids, comets, and leftover planetesimals. So it's important we understand its record if ultimately we're going to interpret what's going on on the moon. Okay. So here's sort of this, this this great um, um, topography image that we have, I think, from all the different Mars machines. And so what you're looking at here is a difference between the South Pole and the North Pole. And what, um, what some of these missions have suggested is that from a topographical standpoint, the North and South Hemispheres of Mars are very different. The Southern Hemisphere is actually uh, higher by about one to three kilometers. But also the crust of the South is much thicker. About 45 kilometers in the South is about 30 kilometers in the North. So they refer to this feature as the global dichotomy. The dichotomy is the oldest feature we can see with our eyes on Mars, at least according to the Martian geologists. Okay, so the question is, how do you get a dichotomy? And there's been lots of debate about this, and the debate still goes on. But about a decade ago, a number of teams came forward and suggested, hey, maybe this, maybe this um, big feature we're seeing was produced by a giant impact. And so we now refer to this giant basin that was created, we call it Borealis Basin. So the thinking is, is that this dichotomy was produced by an impactor, which was at least a thousand kilometers across. And it, at that time, you completely reset the Martian surface. So everything we're seeing on Mars is younger than this particular impact. If there were features there before, they were eliminated by when this happened. So the question is, when did this impact happen? Okay. So here, it's hard to say, it's hard to say much. Okay, so I'm going to give you an argument. Uh, you may disagree with the argument, but at least I'm going to give it. Okay, so so until recently, I, would, I don't think we would have been able to say very much. But um, over the last few years, there's been this really interesting study taking place on these rocks that look a lot like the Martian crust. They're the first breccias we have from Mars. A very famous one is this one called Black Beauty. It has, they have very ancient zircons inside. And I'm showing in some of the other plots, these are some of the ages of the zircons they've been able to obtain from these different meteorites, some which are paired. And what they're finding, if the oldest ages they're getting from these zircons are somewhere on the order of about 4.43 to about 4.48 billion years ago. Okay, so here's the logic. Okay, so if you're making these zircons, what we find is that most of these zircons didn't see anything happen to them at all until they formed in the breccias, in some cases, maybe about 2 billion years ago. So between when the zircons formed, when you made the breccias, it's 2 billion years of history, and they don't see anything happening to them. So if you were to make Borealis somewhere after the zircons were made, then you would expect that Borealis would somehow have heated these samples and changed them in some fashion, and you'd see a big event at that time. The fact that we don't see that event suggests that Borealis probably is older than the zircons themselves. So if that's right, then the Borealis basin is probably at least somewhere in the neighborhood of 4.43 to 4.48 billion years old. Okay? And so that's interesting. That means that Borealis probably formed as a byproduct of plant formation. So we have to sort of think about that when we're interpreting Mars. Okay. So here's the other impacts that we see on Mars. Okay, so here's all the 150 kilometer craters we can see. 
These were all put together in a really wonderful geologic map that Ken Tanaka and the people from USGS put together. You notice that almost all the craters are in the southern hemisphere. Okay, there's very few in the north. Now, the thinking is there's probably lots and lots of craters in the north, but they're all hidden under kilometers of sediment. Somehow, wind blown dust or maybe material moving, moving to the northern hemisphere by water action or what have you has buried all these features. The only distinct basin we can see that's really big in the northern hemisphere is this one called Utopia. And that we can see it, it because it really makes a distinct gravity signature. Okay? But what you also found, what I'm going to show you in a second, is that you, we actually can see evidence for the Borealis boundary here. You see it's sort of green here. I didn't draw it as well as I could, but it's there. But you'll notice that one basin called Dissidus, which I plotted here, sort of takes a bite out of the rim. And that's going to be an important part of the story I'm going to tell in just a second. Okay. So there's been lots of debate over time over how many basins actually exist on Mars. Okay. So a couple of years ago, Jeff Andrews, Han Jeff Andrews Han and I decided to sort of look at this. And we really, in, in talking, we realized we were missing like, a really easy thing you could do. But let's assume the, assume the Borealis boundary is there. And then you start making basins. How many basins statistically could you just add randomly to Mars before you're likely to take chunks out of the grip? Okay. And it turns out we can't add very many. So in this particular model, you're seeing like 36,000 kilometer bases added to Mars. You can see that the rim just should get devastated. There's just no way to avoid it. You're going to get hit. Okay? And it turned out in the end, we can only add just a small number of 1,000 kilometer bases before statistically we would see something we would expect to see. Okay? Um, Jeff also looked at the Borealis boundary and uh, crustal thickness. Okay? And what he found was kind of interesting. If you take this fairly young, fairly large basin that we can see in gravity called Argyre, okay? you can see it actually in the crustal thickness map, its profile is not very different from what we see from Borealis. So if you're going to say, well, let's form Borealis, and then let's make a bunch of basins, and let's erode them all away so we don't see them, the problem you have is the Borealis rim that should be very eroded compared to the Argyre rim. That's not what we see. There's just not a lot of evidence for erosion happening after Borealis forms. So at least in terms of the scale of things we're talking about here. So what all this says is that to some degree, the basins we see on Mars are what we have. If there were earlier basins, they had to have been before Borealis, or we would see them. So we can sort of play the same game we played before. Okay, so what we can do is we can take all the basins and craters that we have on Mars, they're larger than 150 kilometers, and we can scale them to the entire surface of Mars. And then we can take another region close to a basin called Hellas, which is very old, and that's one of the oldest cratered populations we have on Mars. And we'll put that on the same thing, and we'll scale also to the size of Mars. What we get then is a shape. And what's really interesting about this shape is it's actually very similar to what we see in the asteroid belt. Uh, it's the largest sizes, we sort of see of a shallow portion, and then all of a sudden you see this minus three cumulus coming down for smaller craters, and it goes down to, let's say, about you know, 40, 50, 60 kilometer craters before it breaks again. And that's very much like the asteroid belt. Now, I'm going to point out here, despite the fact that I'm saying this is, looks like asteroids, it could also look like leftover planetesimals. It could very well be the leftover planetesimals in the inner solar system have the same size distribution as the asteroid belt. And if, if I get time in the talk, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a second. Okay. So, the question is, when did Martian history start? Okay. Did it start at 4.45 billion years ago? That's kind of what the zircons would suggest. Did it start older? Or are we just missing the boat and maybe Borealis is much younger? If so, you'd have a much younger age and maybe you could do things with that. Okay. So, so that's, that's one way you could go on that. But at the very least, I think what we're saying is that we have a size distribution on Mars for the biggest events that doesn't look like the lunar far side. But arguably, it might be similar to the lunar near side. Okay. So that could suggest a different population was hitting all these worlds, but then some portions were erased on both Mars and the lunar side. Okay. So this is just sort of a scorecard for some different models. I just want to mention them. So I mentioned about the sawtooth and some of its problems. There's also this problem if we can use a, a declining bombardment with the Grand Tack. That's a recent paper that Alessandro Morbidelli and a lot of colleagues came out with in 2017. That does some really nice jobs of explaining different uh, crater populations we have on the moon. But it does make this assumption that both Moon and Mars were not just partially erased, but were both completely erased somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4.35 to 4.4. Okay, so if you might have had many, let's say, South Pole Lake and basin, basin, basins on the Moon, and they would be erased. Now, that could be okay, okay but that is something we have to worry about. There is, you need early erasure to get that model to work, but that might be okay, so we'll see. Finally, there's the uh, early Nice model model. I think this has a lot of really interesting promise, but a lot of it hasn't been checked yet. Okay, so we have to check it against all these different constraints, see how it holds up and what it can do. All right. And here's just, just for those who are, heads are spinning right now, 
here's sort of a cartoon version of what I'm referring to. If let's say, just for, just for example, let's say for the moment the early NICE model is right. So here's kind of the way bombardment would work on the moon and Mars. Let's go back to the earliest times of the solar system history. So Mars forms, at the moment, we don't have a moon. Moon may be formed in 60 million years. But now let's have an early giant planet instability. So then all these things are hitting Mars, and then somewhere in that time, maybe the moon forming impact happens. So now you're having maybe leftover planetesimal and comets hitting both worlds. Okay? But then at some later time, the Borealis impact happens and erases all of Mars. Okay? So then Mars might not see comets anymore. Maybe it just sees leftover planetesimals or just asteroids. On the moon, maybe the far side of the moon is a collection of this really old population, possibly comets, and leftovers and asteroids. Maybe it's just leftovers and asteroids. We're not interpreting things correctly. It's hard to say. But these are some of the games we're going to get to play in the near future as we refine our models and see what goes on. Okay. So let me ask the, the moderators again. I have about, there, there's one more part I could go through. Uh, I can do, do it pretty quickly but I don't want to um, take away from questions if we have questions. This is a natural place to stop if you want me to stop uh, before the next section. Uh, Bill, I think you, please press on because this is recorded and I think it's really important for you to get all your information in and we'll pick up on the questions. We can go a few minutes after the 4.30 time too. Over. It's either that or I like to hear myself talk, one or the other. But we'll, we'll press on a little we bit. We like to hear you talk. <laughs> we like to hear you talk too, Bill. So let me go on to this one other section, just because I think it's really interesting, and I don't think many people know it, um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to touch on it briefly. So we always talk about early bombardment. We're talking about the moon and Mars and the rest, but we never talk about what's going on in the last three billion years. Okay. So, so when you think about the moon, the moon, like most of the major impacts are done at let's say 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago, but there's still a lot of impact cratering which happens on the moon. And keep in mind that if we want to understand what's happened to the Earth in terms of bombardment, you need to understand that history as well. In fact, in some ways, that bombardment may be more important if you're thinking about astrobiology issues. Okay? So what's going on? Okay, so, so if we look at the moon, we can actually go back to certain surfaces that go back about 3 billion years old. These are often referred to by the eras that we have for the moon. So if you take sort of all the Copernican era and what's called the Eratosthenian era, that, goes, that takes you back to about 3 billion years ago. And you can look at this sort of the shape of the size distribution you can get from that. And it turns out that if you look at younger terrains on the moon, they also have that very similar shape. In fact, you can even go further than this to just the moon. Okay? So here's what happens if you take the current near Earth object population, all its diameters, you just multiply their size distribution by 24. Okay? And now let's take that, that shape and compare it to the moon. Let's take it, compare it to Venus. Let's compare it to Mars. It turns out over the last few billion years, they all have the same shape, okay, which is really interesting. If you think about bombardment populations, why in the world would they have such a consistent shape over such a really, really long time? So the reason for this has to do with how asteroids evolve. Okay, and so it leads us to some interesting, interesting questions and, and issues. So what's going on? So we think the story goes kind of like this. Okay, so, so in the asteroid belt, from time to time, you get very large collisions. These, uh, a lot of the collisions that really dominate things are ones that are being breaking up, we're breaking up objects largely hard, larger than 100 kilometers or so. That's where you get a lot of fragments. But the fragments don't really travel very far. They very, stay very close to their impact site. So what happens then is that these fragments just sit there and they start to undergo collisional evolution from all the other background bodies you already have in the asteroid belt. And what happens is you can take a population that has very few fragments. And then collisionally, you can build up into a population that looks a lot like the asteroid belt. And that's what you're seeing in the animation on the left. Okay? You can see, you can recognize all the features, the kind of shallow portion and the steep portion. This is really probably just collisional fragmentation in the asteroid belt. Asteroids very quickly grind themselves into a shape that looks a lot like the background asteroid population. So even if you create a bunch of fresh fragments, but over some period of time, you're going to get the same kind of shape we see today. Okay? And you'll notice that that shape is not so different from the near-Earth object population shape we have. They're sort of a, almost a reflection of one another, which is really interesting. So the question is, like, how does that work? Why, you know, why, does, why should asteroids hitting the Earth or hitting Mars or hitting whatever, why should they look like the asteroid belt? At some level, it's because of this interesting dynamical force called the Yurkoski effect. Okay, so so this, is a, this is a plot showing an asteroid, asteroid family, it's sort of a collection of fragments produced by a big collision. It's called the Coronas family. They're all in red. The yellow is what happens right after one of those collisions I just showed you a movie of. Then what we're going to do is we're going to turn on this non-gravitational force. Okay? So what happens here is that asteroids absorb sunlight, and then eventually they re-radiate that, that, that energy in the infrared. And because of the way these things work, it actually produces a small thrust. 
Okay, there's more details I can say about that, but at the moment, just keep in mind that absorbing sunlight and re-radiating the energy causes asteroids to migrate ever so slightly over a really slow time scale. But if you wait long enough, I'll start the movie here, what you find is that asteroids, some of them move closer to the sun, some of all the way from the sun, but then they can get into dynamical resonances where they can escape the asteroid belt. Okay, so this is how we get near-Earth objects. They come from the asteroid belt as if by a combination of collisions and migration by the Yerkoskian. And you can see this model does a really nice job of reproducing the shape of the families we have as well. So once they get into resonances, they can actually go into the inner solar system and hit all the planets. So here's a whole bunch of objects I started in a particular resonance in the asteroid belt. I'll just start this. Wherever they go, they leave behind a green piece. But the red particles have a chance to hit the Earth, to hit Venus, to hit Mars. And they scatter themselves all through the inner solar system. Okay? So this is, so on some level, whatever size distribution is going into that population, that's what's going to be hitting Mars and the Earth and Venus and all the rest. And so at some level, if you have an asteroid belt which has a consistent size distribution, and that material is coming up by the Yarkovsky effect, that same size distribution is translated onto all the different planets. So that's why we see the size distribution we see. Okay. But there's one other caveat here. This is why I wanted to raise this issue. I think this is getting really exciting, from, at least from my own standpoint, is that every now and then what happens is that asteroids break up on the asteroid belt but they break up really close to escape routes. So imagine you have some asteroid here, break it up, okay? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna throw those fragments directly into some resonance, okay? So let's just do that. So what happens then is all of a sudden you can send this huge flux of material into the inner solar system, okay? And for a time, you can actually change the impact rate of what's hitting different worlds, okay? So the impact rate on Moon and Mars might actually increase for some period of time until essentially most of these fragments were gone. Okay? We call this an asteroid shower, and also asteroid showers can also be promoted by the Yarkovsky effect, right? Imagine creating a bunch of fragments, and then these fragments, which are very, let's say, very uh, prominent close to a resonance, evolve in from the Yarkovsky effect. You can get a long-term change in the impact flux from these kinds of events. Okay? Now, the reason I mentioned this is that we have uh, some recent work that's in press that we're excited about, where we think we can show that over about the last billion years, there's been a big change in the impact flux on the moon. What you're looking at are the ages of craters larger than 10 kilometers on the moon that formed over about the last 600 to 700 million years or so. And it turns out we think that about almost about 300 million years ago, the impact flux may have changed by almost a factor of three. Okay? And we think this is probably related to family forming events. Okay? Uh, that certain family forming events produce so many fragments, they actually increase the impact flux. So this is right, today we're living in an impact high compared to, let's say, what, we, what was going on, let's say, a half a billion years ago or so. And I think there's some really interesting evidence that I'm excited about that says that there may have been also big changes in the impact flux, let's say, maybe back about 1.3 billion years ago. Now, I'll talk a little bit about this at DPS coming up, but also about 2 billion years ago. I think there's some really powerful evidence that something major was happening in the solar system about 2 billion years ago, and it affected all the planets in a major way. And I'm, I'm interested to see where this is going to go. Okay. So I'll just end my talk on this and saying that ultimately the big goal here is we've done a, showed a lot of work, but ultimately we want to answer some of these questions. We're going to have to go back to the moon because lunar samples can tell us about the late stages of planet formation. They can also help us interpret the unknown bombardment history of the Earth and the other worlds. And almost all the big questions we have in planetary science related to our system of worlds is, uh, is ultimately hinges on the answers we get. So I'll stop there and take questions. So, thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Bill. Bill, that was really great. And Bill, that was great. So uh, Ariel Deutsch is going to uh, introduce the questions here. Okay. And, and I'm, no, I'm not, uh, one, one thing, I'm not looking at the at your screen. Do I need to look at the screen with the questions, or can I just listen? You can just listen. You just listen. Over. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Our first question is from Amanda Soderman at Arizona, and she asks. If carbonaceous asteroids were scattered into the inner solar system, in the early solar system, then why don't we see mixing between carbonaceous and non-carbonaceous asteroids? Are there intermediately carbonaceous meteorites, and are there any observations of mixing between carbonaceous and non-carbonaceous end members? Okay, I think if I'm interpreting her question, I think what she's asking is like, yeah, so why don't we see mixing? Like, if you're throwing all this stuff in, why don't you start making planetesimals that are kind of combinations of inner solar system and outer solar system stuff? Okay. And I think the answer is, 
is that all these, all these, we're forming plantesimals in each given region before you mix them, right? So what's happening is that, um, you know, like big 100 kilometer guys and the rest are forming in the outer solar system, and only there are they being transferred in. If you transfer in dust and the rest, you could have some of that stuff in the asteroid belt, but it might just keep going from gas drag. It might not stay in the asteroid belt. There's also, and this is turning out to be a critical issue, and this actually, a lot of our answers to this may hinge on this question, is where actually do planetesimals form? There, there's a certain efficiency in making um, uh, planetesimals in gravitational, uh, essentially, I'm sorry, it's a real issue where you make planetesimals in terms of eddies or these turbulent concentration zones, right? And the question is, are everywhere equally efficient? There could be some places that are more efficient than others. And the example you would have of this is if you think about the Kuiper Belt. Okay, so we think the Kuiper Belt might have been, let's say, over 20 Earth masses. But there's sort of this, this very distant component of the Kuiper Belt that's called the cold classical population. And it's actually fairly low mass. It's about, let's say, between about 40 and 50 AU or so. It could be that simply planetesimal formation was not very efficient up there. So it could be that in the asteroid belt, also planetesimal formation may not have been very efficient there and may have been efficient in much more in other places. So that's why the asteroid belt is sort of a collection of things rather than things that formed in situ. So I hope that answers the question, uh, but it's a really interesting question. And I don't know if we have a firm answer, but I think that's what uh, planetesimal experts would say. Um, and then for a follow-up question, for the increased bombardment at around 300, 1.3, 2.3 billion years you just mentioned, how long does that increased bombardment last? Does it just fade away with time? How long would the decay and bombardment take? So as far as we can tell for what's going on over the last 300 million years, that essentially the impact floods became higher, and it's, it's still going on today, so we're still in the middle of it. Basically what happens is that sometimes you can throw things into a resonance, and then that material gets to the Earth very quickly, but then it might go away very quickly. But by the Yurokoski effect, things continue to drift on. They continue to sort of drive over the cliff, so to speak. And so you can have a sort of a long-term, maybe shower isn't always the best word, but think about sort of a rising tide, where the tide is going up because more material keeps going into the escape route. It keeps doing that for some extended period of time. And so I think that might also be what's happening in other parts of solar system time. So there may be a lot more variation in impacts on the moon than what's often thought. People, the you know, traditional view is everyone thinks the impact flux for large things is constant for the last three billion years. That may not be true, but it may be true that small things are much harder to change. So small things may be a much more constant flux over time. If that makes sense. Okay, back to the early solar system. So we have a question on how trans-Neptunian objects fit into models of solar system formation, and also a question on how Mercury, with its large core, fits into models of solar system formation. Okay, so that, those are two really interesting questions. I, I think, um, I'll, all right, so if I had had three hours and I could continue to talk really fast, right, I would talk about something else, uh, something else that's really kind of fun. So in a, in a model we did recently uh, with David Bogrudski, um, uh, as lead author, we looked into what the, uh, what the giant planet instability release model does to trans-Neptunian objects at some level. We find that some of them actually become captured in the asteroid belt during this time. Some of them become captured as trojans and irregular satellites, and there's all sorts of different papers on this. But what also happens is that as Neptune goes out, it sort of sculpts the Kuiper belt the, the way we see it today. So the, essentially the, the, the dynamical shape of the Kuiper belt, where, where it has concentrations, why some objects are in resonance and the rest, this is all sculpted by the migration of Neptune through the Kuiper Belt. And so I, I think that's, so in terms of TNOs, they're, all their constraints in terms of their orbits, their sizes, all the rest, and where they're located, and all the places they ended up after the instability are really powerful constraints of what actually happened. In terms of Mercury and its large core, you know, there's a big debate about this issue. Okay, so the question is, right, is Mercury, all right, so Mercury has a, you know, from a proportional standpoint, it has a very large core compared to all the other terrestrial planets. The question is why? And the debate in the field has sort of gone something like this. That some people argue that a giant collision happened to Mercury, and you blasted away most of the crust, and you just left behind an iron-rich iron remnant, and that's what we see today. There's a second idea that says that what we're seeing with Mercury is mostly, for whatever reason, you had um, many more, um, you know, much more condensation of iron and other material near Mercury, so Mercury is a byproduct of what formed there. Okay? It's not necessarily a byproduct of a giant collision, 
It's just telling you the nature of the material that happened to exist in that zone. And at the moment, I don't know which one is right. Okay? I've seen interesting arguments for both ways. Um, despite the fact I love giant impacts, I sort of slightly favor the idea that maybe mercury is just made from the stuff in that zone. But then the question is, how do you get that to work? And I think that's another really interesting component of what we're going to have in our plant formation models. What I've mostly shown you today is dynamics. But then adding in the geochemistry and getting that right is a huge um, issue for the future. So do you think for the mercury hypothesis, some geochemical measurements might help constrain between the two theories? Absolutely. Um, and so, so for example, um, some people have argued, I think, from the I think it's potassium uranium measurements we have from uh, messenger. I mean, I, I mean, I forget which two elements this might be potassium thorium. I forget. Anyway, what they suggest is that uh, that mercury much might look very much like our antichondrites, and it may actually even have it might be more volatile rich than maybe people would have suspected. That might favor a model where it didn't experience a giant impact. Okay, but if we could, but but no one's really sure. There's lots of arguments, and I've seen Sarah Stewart argue. No, no, she can explain things with a giant impact pretty well as well. So we'll see how that works out. But ultimately, look, if we could get samples of Mercury, or we could get samples of Venus, you know, boy, wouldn't that, that's like almost like a holy grail. If we could do that, though, then we could say something about what the nature of planet formation was like in the terrestrial planet region from a compositional standpoint. Is every planet distinct, or essentially is there a huge zone where most of the planets look very similar from an isotopic standpoint? Uh, I think that could revolutionize our ideas of what's going on, or at least settle a lot of problems. So I'm all for getting samples if possible. Okay, another early solar system question. Do any planetary accretion models result in a planet X? And how would the existence of another large body in the outer solar system influence the evolution of giant planets and asteroids? Okay, boy, that's another interesting question. Okay, so so here's the point. Right, so Again, if I had another three-hour talk, there's another component I'd put in here. So I mostly just showed you the like the, the, the giant planet instability I showed you had four giant planets. Okay? But, it, but it turns out some of the simulations that we're uh, using right now actually have a fifth giant planet. They have like another Uranus. So imagine Jupiter, Saturn, and like three Neptune-sized bodies or so. Those models are about 10 times more likely to reproduce constraints than just the four giant planet models. And actually, they do a lot of interesting things. And I think I can make a pretty interesting case that that's, um, that that's probably what's going on. Okay, so, so eventually, though, we, we don't have that, that extra planet today. So it probably very early on in solar system history gets ejected. And so the question is, people have asked, is that is the planet that gets ejected likely to be planet X or planet 9 or whatever you want to call it? And the answer is probably not, but I'm not sure. Okay, so the, the issue is if you're going to make a planet at that great distance, it's very hard to do. So it seems like planet X would be more likely to come from the giant planet zone and then be thrown out. But the problem is, in order to stop it from just being thrown away, it has to sort of encounter roughly its own mass. And so we don't think there's enough mass out there to sort of capture that planet. And so then it would just keep going. With that said, though, I've seen some really good people that do planetesimal formation that argue that out at 100 AU, we may have a lot of mass out there. We may have so much mass that perhaps you could capture some, an object like a planet 9. And if that's true, then maybe that's where it could come from. Um, I think these are really interesting issues. I think if we could, if if anyone can find Planet X is real, I think it really presents some thought-provoking problems for our planet formation models. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to see what happens. Right now, I think the debate is still wide open, and I see smart people on both sides, and I don't know where it's, I don't know how it's going to play out. So I think that's a that's a quick answer. And then um, how Planet X affects things in the outer solar system sort of a complicated question. Basically, at the moment, it, it looks like um, you could sort of make an argument that it's affected and reshaped some material out there, or some of the orbital distribution of some objects out there. Or you could make an argument that we're mostly just looking at biases and other things. And I don't know which way that's going to fall yet. We're going to, I mean, we need more data ultimately to solve that problem. OK, a couple of questions about the bombardment history of the moon specifically. Okay. Um, would you? Would you be able to identify impacts that happened while the magma ocean was cooling near the end of lid formation? Um, for example, maybe by the morphology of the crater. And can we tell anything about bombardment history by the presence or absence of these craters? Yeah, I think, okay, so that's a really interesting question. And actually something that I'd like to do some work on in the near future, but maybe others will work on it too. When you look at the far side of the moon, and, and also some work that, uh, that's come out of the Francis Nemo group, They've looked at the possibility that some basins on the far side seem very viscously relaxed, almost as if they formed in a place which was very warm 
Okay, and then they gradually cooled. Or what maybe happened is that the magma ocean was still going on and they sort of could you know, pick up that viscous relaxation and take a more subdued appearance, kind of like what we think had happened on Ceres. You know, the fact that Ceres lives in the middle of the asteroid belt, you know, it doesn't seem to have enormous basins on it like we'd expect. People have argued that's maybe because it has some kind of subsurface uh, low viscosity zone. Okay? So maybe that same thing is on the moon. I would love to take a greater look or a more in-depth look at some of these subdued craters on the far side. I think the work that's been done so far is really exciting, but I'd love to see more. So the bombardment histories that you talked about are obviously tied to the Apollo samples. And so we had a question on whether you could talk a little bit about the certainty of our age estimates from lunar samples and also maybe comment on where you think we need additional samples from to further constrain the lunar geologic history. Okay, I, I, I can answer the second question. Could, could you say the first part of the question? I, I, missed, the, I missed the very beginning. Um, just a question about the certainty of age estimates that currently exist. Okay, okay so this was, right, so at the last bombardment workshop, and this was just maybe a week ago or so, there's huge, huge debate on this. Okay, so, so here's the issue is that some samples, I would argue, have been dated very well. They're, they've been dated in multiple chronometers. You know, they, we have rubidium strontium, we have uranium lead, we have argon argon. Okay. Uh, other people uh, would argue that if some of the argon argon measurements we have are not are less good. And then the question, and then with all these models, even if you have good ages, I would argue in many cases we have good ages, but the question is always context. You know, are you really dating what you think you're dating? Uh, I remember Paul Spudis before he passed away once said that you know the ideal position to be in would be go to the moon, find like an impact melt outcrop near some basin, and go take a sample of that in context, and then you'd be able to date that basin. The problem is almost all the samples we're getting now don't have that kind of context. So you hope you're dating a basin, but you don't know. That's why there's been so much debate. So ideally, it'd be nice to go to, you know, identify the exact place where you might see like an impact mill outcrop and then date the basins based on getting a sample there, either by bringing the sample back or maybe by in situ dating. Um, I think that would be the best way. In terms of the ages themselves, I don't think I'm the right person to ask because I'm a dynamicist. Um, I would say there are differing views. I tend to be... I, t I guess I tend to favor the view that a lot of our ages are probably decent and that only very few are bad, but opinions differ. Okay, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, we have a question from Rob Muller from NASA Swamp Work, and he asks, what are the implications of lunar bombardment knowledge for space resource mining on the moon? Oh, that's an interesting question. Okay, so let me, let me give you, all right. So in terms of resources, I mean, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to choose to interpret resources as water, okay? And like, do we have water resources on the moon? So I think, I think it's pretty clear, and I think, um, um, you know, there's lots of people at Brown and other places that have talked about volatiles on the moon trapped in, uh, you know, trapped in, um, in, in permanently shadowed craters on, on the poles of the moon. The question is, where did that water come from? Okay. So um, one possibility is that the water came from the interior of the moon, and then um, a really interesting hypothesis is that you know when when all the Mari regions were forming on the moon, that all of the all of the volcanism itself produced enough water you know outgassing that ultimately some of that uh, water went to the poles. But given some of the modeling work we're doing, um, comets might be an interesting factor here. It, it's conceivable that a very early early population of comets hit the moon. Okay? Maybe when it was still in sort of its formative stages. So then the question is. Did that water find a place to hide? Did it, did it actually find a cold trap where it could stay in some fashion? Um, did it actually you know, get into the interior in some kind of extreme cases? I think these could be our interesting questions. So in terms of how to mine it, I think in the end, the best place to mine it would probably be where we see it today in, in some quantity, which would be the, polar, the, 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 the cold traps. In terms of other resources, like highly severe elements and the rest, I would argue it's probably easier to go to asteroids to get those kinds of things than on the moon. Just because I think on the moon they're likely to be so diffuse, um, but I'm I'm not an expert on that particular issue, so I think I'll I think I'll stop there before I say something stupid. Okay, two last questions. Um, the first is regarding your final comparison of the bombardment population. And the question is, what is the significance of the F equals 24 multiplication factor that you use? Oh, okay, well that that was taken from another talk. That's a paper I have submitted right now. Is Again, there's, again, if I had three hours, 
Dr. Martin. Um, the, idea, the idea is what I found, which is kind of interesting, is that if you take asteroids, and, or the after, if you take the nearest object population we have, you take the diameters we have, which are getting pretty good now, we have wise information on nearest object diameters. You take that size distribution and you multiply all the asteroid sizes by 24, that, the, and sort of assume that, that that number is what it takes to make a crater. So every time you have an asteroid hit a surface, you multiply it by 24, that gives you crater diameter. It turns out that works remarkably well at explaining craters that we see on almost every trust on, on every terrestrial planet. So if I have a paper that is still in review on this, I'm going to discuss much more about this. Um, one of the really interesting implications of this work uh, from this is, if this is right, then it, it could mean that it takes much smaller projectiles to make large craters on all these surfaces, including the Earth, than we thought before. You know, so for example, to make a chicxulub sized crater, rather than needing a 10-kilometer asteroid, you might only need about a 6-kilometer asteroid as well. And the reason why I think that makes sense is that actually may match some of the iridium and osmium deposits that we have from Chicxulub and other places. So there's a lot of arguments I develop on that, but that's the significance of the 24. So if you want to hear more, uh, come find me, or hopefully my paper will get accepted, and then you can see it. Okay, thanks. And then lastly, okay, then. Oh, do we have time for one last question? Absolutely. Okay, so regarding Mars, do you think that Phobos and Deimos may be related to the Borealis impact or another impact? I, I think they are. I think the easiest model I've seen is that, that you, you have a giant impact on Mars, you make a proto-Martian disk, and out of that disk you get Phobos and Deimos. Uh, there's been some really neat papers on this. Uh, the most recent paper has come out of our group. Um, basically, Robin Knup and Julian Simone have, have written on this. And I think that's the easiest way to explain uh, those bodies. And it, to me, it's a lot easier to make those bodies if you have like, a big impact than, let's say, something like Hellasize or the rest. But I think they probably came from Borealis. That would actually make some arguments that the crater record we see on Phobos and Deimos is fairly consistent with the entire crater record on Mars if you sort of scale them up. And so I think that suggests that they probably are they were they form similar in time. Great, thanks, Bill. Those are all the questions we have here today. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'll take it from here. Thanks so much, uh, Bill. This has really been spectacular. Um, I have to say that uh, it's. Uh, you know, really, I'm glad you talked as long as you did because it filled in a lot of uh, missing parts of our understanding, and we look forward to being able to actually go back and um, and review this. And for those of you out there who are being threatened by the storm and other kinds of things that might not have been able to tune in, et cetera, we'll, we'll have this online within a day. Uh, it's snowing here in Moscow, um, so if you're uh, steaming in a, in a hurricane or whatever, I hope you're doing okay. Um, uh, next week, we'll have... Uh, the Highland Rock Suite, Clues to Early Winter Evolution by Clive Neal. The readings for that are already online, and I'll send out a detailed announcement for that um, over the weekend here. So, Bill, we really want to thank you very, very much. Uh, superb, superb lecture, and uh, and we'll, we'll be back in touch for that paper. If anybody's reviewing that paper, please make sure it gets accepted. Thanks again. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot, and I, I'm, glad I, I hope, I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thanks for your nice comments. Okay, thank great. you.